Hey, welcome back to Hacks Lab. Today we're going to start off with an objective statement of fact. Super Nintendo is the greatest video game console ever created. My family got ours for Christmas of 1996 and I remember like it was yesterday. One of the games we got that Christmas was the Super Nintendo version of SimCity. And of all the various Sim Cities I've played over the years, this one's still my favorite. The music's great, the graphics are charming, there's a complexity yet simplicity to the gameplay, and Bowser makes an appearance just wandering around f***ing everything up. So consider my surprise when 22 years later, the Video Game History Foundation bursts into the room and says, Hi. There was an NES version of SimCity. We got our hands on the prototype. Here's the ROM. Merry Christmas. I remember it like it was yesterday. And that's why I'm here today. Playing this forbidden gem of history on an emulator is well and good, but playing on real hardware would be something special. So, I'll be creating a reproduction cartridge of the SimCity prototype for NES that can be played on a real NES. The way it was, once upon a time, meant to be. Before I get down to brass tacks, we need to talk a little bit about NES cartridges. Inside most carts, you'll find the following. The program ROM, which contains the game's code. The character ROM, which contains the game's graphics. The lockout chip for most of us in non-Japan territories. Finally, more likely than not, there would be some mapper hardware. This is essentially an NES upgrade built right into the cartridge. It allowed the system to do things that it couldn't do by itself, such as play bigger games, draw better graphics, add save capabilities, stuff like that. But what does all this have to do with creating our SimCity cartridge? Well, we'll be taking an existing NES game and replacing the program and character ROMs for chips that have had the SimCity game code and graphics burned to them. But if it were just as simple as swapping out chips, this video would be much shorter and a hell of a lot less boring. Remember that mapper thing I was talking about and how it's NES upgrade hardware in a cartridge? Well, there's lots of different mappers out there and every game is designed to use a particular one. Much like how a PS2 game isn't going to work in a GameCube, the hardware is simply different. But it goes a level deeper than that because every mapper can come in various different flavors. Let's take a look. Here before me I have three MMC1 mapper games. I have Air Fortress from a company called HAL. You may know them for a little game called Super Smash Brothers. Original Gold Cartridge Legend of Zelda. And Metroid. Same mapper, very different insides. Let's pop them open and find out. Alright. On the surface, everything looks pretty similar. Zelda has a battery because Zelda is the only one of these games with proper saves. And Air Fortress here, a uh, slightly different chip layout. All the same chips though. MMC1, MMC1, MMC1. Copy chip, copy chip, copy chip. But Air Fortress here is on an SJ ROM board. It has a character ROM and it has a program ROM and it has some work RAM. Zelda here, obviously, has the battery, has character RAM, program ROM, and work RAM. No character ROM here at all. Must be stored in the game. It's an SN ROM board. Also an SM ROM board is Metroid. Same stuff as over here. Character RAM, work RAM, program ROM. No battery. The moral of the story here is do your research before you buy your donor cartridge or you might have a bad time. And a great place to do that research is the NES CartDB, which 
We'll tell you just about anything you want to know about almost every NES and Famicom game ever created. It'll tell you things like the PCB class, and the mapper chip, does it or does it not have a battery, all that good stuff. Doesn't work for SimCity because they don't have it in the database, but the Video Game History Foundation provided pictures of the prototype board, and going off of that, I know that I need to get an ET ROM game. So I'm gonna go do that. Eating my own advice, I took a journey down to the NES Cart DB to see what NES ET ROM games I could find, and there are four of them. Then I took a second journey over to eBay to see how much these carts were going to cost me, and, well, to be honest, it's a little bit more than I'm willing to spend on something that I'm probably going to break. I wonder about their Famicom counterparts. <laughs> well, shit, it looks like we're making a Famicom game. <laughs> The cartridge selection nonsense done, it's time to shift focus to creating the new ROM chips. For this we'll be using erasable programmable ROMs, or EEPROMs. Not to be confused with EEPROMs, which are electronically erasable, and more commonly known as flash memory. Unlike its younger cousins, erasing an EEPROM is done by UV light beamed into a little window right on the chip. Now we're going to be needing two of these, one for program ROM and one for character ROM. But how do you know what chips to use? Unlike the mess that is mappers and PCB classes, there's actually a pretty simple rule you can follow for this one. If your chip data is 64 kilobytes or smaller, use a 27C512. If it's bigger than that, use a 27C040. But how do you know how big that chip data is? Obviously the NES card DB will tell you, but I've also created a tool at rom.solutions that can extract that information right from any NES ROM file. In SimCity's case, both program and character ROM are 128K, so I'll be using the larger chips. Uh, this is a quick note from the edit bay. I've just learned that things get a little weird with 128 kilobyte ROMs. Um, I lucked out in my case, but uh, yeah, that research thing I keep harping on, do it. And while I'm here, I'll use ROM dot solutions to split out the data I need to burn to each chip. It's pretty damn convenient. Almost like it was planned. With that, we have the chips and the stuff to put on them, so let's light these coals up and get to burning. To do said burning, I'm using one of these mini pro ROM programmers that you can grab off the internet for about 50 United States bucks. You can burn all kinds of chips, but most importantly, the ones we care about, like the one I'm dropping in right now. Be sure you line the notches up correctly, or something's liable to get ruined. Like your day. Now we fire up the programming software, select the proper chip maker and model, and verify that the chip is actually empty. I got my new old stock from Jameco, so it's good to go right out of the box, but not a few minutes in the UV sun will set you on your way. Next, either the program or character ROM is loaded up, and programming can't commence. Take a second to grab some coffee and pray to your god that the power doesn't go out, because this is going to take a minute. Once it's done though, rinse and repeat for the other chip and uh, we're ready to move on to the final phase of this project. With all the ancillary pieces in place, we're finally down in the lab, and step one is to crack the donor cartridge open. You'll likely need a game bit screwdriver for this, but some carts use plain old standard screws. Regardless, the tool you need exists somewhere out there on the internet for purchase. Once open, identify the two ROM chips. It's pretty easy, one says program ROM and the other says character ROM. Once you've done that, flip the board over and identify them on the solder side because you don't want to have spent four months working on a crappy internet video just to remove the wrong chips. Speaking of removing chips, I will disclaim that my desoldering skills are pretty bad. Now these chips could be cut out as I've done in the past and it would make this process much easier, but I want to preserve the ROMs in this case for history or something. Therefore, I will explain my process for the sake of completeness. The first thing I do is add a little bit of solder to each point on the chip. 
I found this helps melt the existing solder, plus it adds some extra mass for the solder sucking tool. And on that point, once the extra solder has been added, I heat each pin and then use the desoldering tool to remove as much solder as possible. It's not going to be perfect, especially on those larger power and ground copper fills, which is why in my next pass, I use the hot air tool on my solder station to heat the underside of the board while carefully prying underneath the chip from the top side. I'm going to admit this is probably terrible in all sorts of ways, from potentially damaging the chip to warping the board and breaking a trace. I did this with four chips in the course of this project and managed not to destroy anything, but I make absolutely no guarantees. The exact same thing is done for the other chip, and I'm not going to make you watch because who wants to watch the same thing twice or eight times in a row? With the two original ROMs pulled, it's time to drop in the new ones, but there's a hiccup. In what is likely a cost-cutting measure, some of these PCBs were actually designed to work both with the smaller 28-pin ROMs and the larger 32-pin ROMs. To accommodate this, the 32-pin ROMs Nintendo used were not industry standard like their smaller ones were, and so my industry standard larger ROM is going to require a little bit of rewiring. This is going to differ on a mapper to mapper basis, so be sure to do your research. I used the EEPROM datasheet and the NES Dev Wiki's page on mask ROM pinouts to figure out what it was that I needed to remap. To do that rewiring, I'm using magnet wire, which you've been watching me fiddle around with. It ticks a lot of nice boxes for this project. It's solid core, so it'll hold its shape. It's coated, so I don't have to worry about shorts. And it's very thin, so the cartridge shouldn't bulge when it's all put back together. Before I drop any chips in, I'll be adding some of that magnet wire to the pinholes that need to be remapped and solder those down. Next, I very, very, very carefully bend the corresponding pins on the EEPROM up and then push the chip into the PCB. It may take a little finagling to get in, but gentleness is the order of the day because these pins are fragile and are prone to breaking. As is often the case, patience is key. Once in, I'll solder a few pins down just to keep the chip from coming loose. Now, again, being very, very careful, I run the whole wire across the top of the chip to its corresponding pin, and then solder those two together. And then spend the next two hours doing the same thing for the remaining wires, somewhere in there remembering that you have pins that need to be soldered down as well. With that hellish nightmare over, I'll close the whole thing back up, sacrifice a goat trying to catch the smile of a wayward god, and hope for the best as this project moves into its final step. accurate copy of a video game that was never released. Now, could all of this have been done simpler? Sure, an SD card and an NES EverDrive would scratch that play it on console itch, but then I wouldn't be able to brag and say I own one of three known copies of this game, plus the only one with a sexy production quality label. Now, I hope this video inspires you to check out the fascinating world of Nintendo cartridges because it is fascinating, and uh, I've barely scratched the surface. You can jump into the links below of all the websites that I mentioned in this video as a good place to start, but if you only read one of those, I highly recommend checking out the Video Game History Foundation's article about The SimCity That Never Was. And of course, I'd like to thank you for watching this, and you know, maybe we'll see each other again, like in year, year and a half. Oh! Oh snap! My beard's back! Oh thank god! I can get rid of this awful thing! 
Ah, no, if you'll excuse me, I've got uh, 25 years of gaming history to catch up on.